Hello, Eastbridge Academy, sixth grade. Today we are going to uh, read through I Never Had It Made, um, which is a nonfiction story, and it's in our study sync books. Um, and it is a nonfiction story because it's from Jackie Robinson's autobiography. Um, and just a quick bit of background, uh, Jackie Robinson was the first African-American baseball player um, to play um, in the MLB with white players. And as the introduction down here says, break the color line. So we're going to make sure we read that introduction because it's always important to read that information. Remember on things like, say, the state test, for example, um, there is oftentimes a question that has a little something to do with the introduction, just to kind of throw you for a loop and make sure you read it. In 1947, Jackie Robinson, a talented baseball player and man of great character, made history as the first African-American baseball player to break the color line and play in modern Major League Baseball. In this excerpt from his autobiography, Robinson reflects back on his experience and its impact on American society. So Jackie Robinson um, was the first uh, black player to play in what is now the MLB. Um, and that was a significant and momentous change. And so this is an excerpt from his autobiography, and we're going to get a little bit of uh, insight into his life. Um, and we're going to read through that today. Again, as we are, as you're reading, I always highly recommend that you use the notes section on the side of the page. Um, and then of course, always make sure to read anything in italics, even if it's short, because it could give you a clue um, as to what some of the questions are asking of you. Um, and I always, again, always recommend that you read um, anything you're going to have to answer questions on or be tested on. Uh, more than once. Um, ideally twice, you have your first read so you can kind of take it in, then you have your second read to go through and really kind of pick it apart and pull at the details. I had become the first black player in the major leagues. We're reading right up here. And this is from Preface Today. I guess if I could choose one of the most important moments in my life, I would go back to 1947 in the Yankee Stadium in New York City. It was the opening day of the World Series, and I was for and I was for the first time playing in the series as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers team. It was a history-making day. It would be the first time that a black man would be allowed to participate in a World Series. I had become the first black player in the major leagues. I was proud of that, and yet I was uneasy. I was proud to be in the hurricane eye of a six of a significant breakthrough and to be used to prove that a sport can't be called national if blacks are barred from it branch ricky the president of the brooklyn dodgers had rudely awakened america he was a man with high ideals and he was also a shrewd businessman mr ricky had shocked some of his fellow baseball tycoons and angered others by deciding to smash the unwritten law that kept blacks out of the big leagues he had chosen me as the person to lead the way it hadn't been easy some of my own teammates refused to accept me because I was black. I had been forced to live with snubs and rebuffs and rejections. With, within the club, Mr. Ricky had put down rebellion by letting my teammates know that anyone who didn't want to accept me could leave. But the problems within the Dodgers club had been minor compared to the opposition outside. It hadn't been that easy to fight the resentment expressed by players on other teams, by the team owners, or by bigoted fans screaming... The hate mail piled up. There were threats against me and my family and even out and out attempts at physical harm to me. Some things counterbalanced this ugliness. Black people supported me with total loyalty. They supported me morally. They came to sit in a hostile audience in unprecedented numbers to make the turnstiles hum as they never had. Before at ballparks all over the nation. Money is America's God, and business people can dig black power if it coincides with green power, so these fans were important to the success of Mr. Ricky's noble experiment. 
Some of the Dodgers who swore they would never play with a black man had a change of mind when they realized I was a good ball player who could be helpful in their earning a few thousand more dollars in World Series money. After the initial resistance to me had been crushed, my teammates started to give me tips on how to improve my game. They hadn't changed because they liked me any better. They had changed because I could help fill their wallets. My fellow Dodgers were not decent out of self-interest alone. There were heartwarming experiences with some team teammates. There was Southern born Pee Wee Reese who turned into a staunch friend and there were others. Mr. Ricky stands out as the man who inspired me the most. He will always have my admiration and respect. Critics had said, don't you know that your precious Mr. Ricky didn't bring you up out of the black leagues because he loved you. Are you stupid enough to not understand that the Brooklyn club profited hugely because of what Mr. Ricky did? Yes, I know that, but I also know what a big gamble he took. A bond developed between us that lasted long after I had left the game. In a way, I feel I was the son he had lost, and he was the father I had lost. There is more than just making money at stake in Mr. Ricky's decision. I learned that his family was afraid that his health was being undermined by the resulting pressures and that they pleaded with him to abandon the plan. His peers and fellow baseball moguls exerted all kinds of influence to get him to change his mind. Some of the press condemned him as a fool and a demagogue, but he didn't give in. In a very real sense, black people helped make the experiment succeed. Many who came to the ballpark had not been baseball fans before I began to play in the big leagues. Suppressed and repressed for so many years, they needed a victorious black man as a symbol. It would help them believe in themselves, but black support for the f of the first black man in the majors was a complicated matter. The breakthrough created as much danger as it did hope. It was one thing for me out there on the playing field to be able to keep my cool in the face of insults. It was another for all those black people sitting in the stands to keep from overreacting when they sensed a racial slur or an unjust decision. I learned from Rachel, who had spent hours in the stands, that clergymen and laymen had held meetings in the Black community to spread the word. We all knew about the help of the Black press. Mr. Ricky and I owed them a great deal. Children from all races came to the stands. The very young seemed to have no hang up at all about my being Black. They just wanted me to be good to deliver, to win. The inspiration of their innocence is amazing. I don't think I'll ever forget the small shrill victory of a small tiny white kid who in the midst of a racially tense atmosphere during an early game in a Dixie town cried out, boy, Jackie. It broke the tension and it made me feel I had succeeded. The black and the white the, the black and the young were my cheering squads, but also there were people, neither black nor young, people of all races and faiths, and in all parts of the country, people who couldn't care less about my race. Rachel was even more important to my success. I know that every successful man is supposed to say that without his wife, he can never have accomplished success. It is gospel in my case. Rachel shared those difficult years that led to this moment and helped me through all the days thereafter. She has been strong, loving, gentle, and brave, never afa afraid to either criticize or comfort me. So that is an excerpt from Jackie Robinson's autobiography. And this is, I think it's a significant um, story to read. I think it's really important um, what, it, what this story is for our history and what, um, and that getting Jackie Robinson's thoughts as the man who went through it, I think is just super important. So we're going to move on to our think questions and we're going to kind of just briefly go over instructions for them. And I'm going to give you a little guidance on them. Um, tomorrow we'll talk about our focus questions and the writing prompt. But today we're just going to focus on the think questions. So question one, refer to one or more details from the text to support your understanding of why Jackie Robinson feels so uneasy about opening day of the World Series both from ideas that are directly stated and ideas that you have inferred from clues in the text. So he talks about opening day pretty early on in the story. And 
we can go early on in this excerpt that we have and we can go take a look and see what Jackie Robinson says about this. Now, it also tells us to in, have ideas that we have inferred. Now, just as a refresher, to make an inference is to basically use the body of evidence in front of us, in this case, the text, the way things are talked about, and to basically create an educated guess. So we're essentially creating this idea from what isn't completely said. Um, so when Jackie Robinson says he's uneasy, why else might he be uneasy? What else do we know about the time that he doesn't mention, but we can piece together? So make sure to include both, because when it says both from ideas that are directly stated and ideas that you have inferred, you can't just pick one or the other. You've got to do both. Um, that's like one of those things where like on the state test, as we've talked about, which is coming up soon. Um, it's one of those things where it's just, you got to check the box, guys. Um, make sure you do both when the question asks you to do both things. And it's just use for question two, it says to use details from the text to write two or three sentences describing different ways people treated Jackie Robinson. So I would probably, in this case, um, say that I would probably write more than two or three sentences, um, because I think you want to be able to actually talk about what people said. Um, so like, I would probably go back to um, actually earlier on this page in paragraph 11, um, where Jackie Robinson is talking about the tension and the young boy. And I would start there and then I would say something about it. It's one thing to just say, this happens. It's another thing to actually say something about it and why it's important. So remember that surface level thinking is saying this happened and this is how he was treated. This is the response. Okay, but we always wanna go deeper, always go deeper and then actually say something about what that means. Why is it so significant that that event in paragraph 11 happens? That's, that's the higher level thinking we're looking for. In question number three, we're going to write two or three sentences exploring who Jackie Robinson credits with contributing to his success and why. There's several people um, that you can um, pick here. You don't have to list all of them. But um, you want to have at least one. You could realistically have two um, quite easily. And you want to make sure that you reference the text and have some of that evidence in there. A good answer it says, you know, these are the people who supported Jackie Robinson. You get the right people, that's a good answer. It's a better answer when you can support with some sort of evidence from the text and say it says this in this paragraph and it's an even better answer when you can say specifically in this paragraph it says and then you quote it to give you even better support that's going to be your best answer and for question number four we're going to look up the we're going to use context to determine the meaning of the word shrewd as it is used in I never had it made and that is used I believe on our first page and in there um, he talks about uh, Mr. Um, he talks about Mr. Ricky being a shrewd businessman and that is yep that's in paragraph two so based on what you read in paragraph two um, you're going to look for how to uh, pull that together. And you're going to say, all right, based on this, this is what I read. And because this is what I read here, I believe that shrewd means this. And then they want you to use a dictionary or a thesaurus to find the precise definition of the word. Um, you can use an online dictionary. And then it says Revi revise your original definition is needed. I'm not going to make you revise your original definition. I really want to see your thought process and what you're pulling out of the context. And then number five, I'm not going to tell you where inspiration is. Um, I'm going to make you look for that one on your own. 
Um, you're going to come up with a definition of inspiration based on the context and explain how you got there. So this should include something from the text where it's the word inspiration is used in this way. And because it is used in this way, I believe that inspiration, the, a, a good definition of inspiration is, and then give your definition. You want to have some, give me some idea as to how you got there. You can't just say that, like, I walked outside and it was sunny today and the sun's lights, the sun's rays showed me the answer. And that was it. Like, give me something. Go to the text. Give me a quote. Give me something specific. Don't be just abstract and overly general. So that's it for the think questions and the story today. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to dig into the focus questions a little bit. Um, and I'll give you some guidance on those and a little bit of guidance on the uh, on how to answer those because the focus questions, again, are always a little bit more in depth. And that will wrap us up for the week. You have a wonderful day, Explorers, and I'll see you next time.